Hello, and welcome to Please Me. Last week, Leslie Draffin was on the show talking about how magic mushrooms can be used to help those who suffer from anxiety and depression, but also talks about how it can affect your sensual health as well. Be sure to go back and listen to her incredible story. This podcast is intended for mature audiences. Eve is a licensed physical therapist who is on a mission to destigmatize conversations about sex. Eve treats conditions related to sexual health. Please unwind, surrender, and bask in the pleasure of Please Me. Hello, and welcome to Please Me, the podcast that aims to destigmatize conversations about sex by turning the sheets into our classroom. Today, I have the honor of welcoming Paul Zolman to the podcast. He is a love, language, and linguist expert, and I am so excited to talk to him today. He is a best-selling author of The Role of Love, and I would love to bring him on now and say hello. Hi, Paul. How are you today? Hi, Eve. Thank you for inviting me to be on your podcast. I'm very excited to be here today. Thank you so much. Um, I would love to hear what got you interested in writing about love and a little bit about your story. What got me interested in writing about love actually was I grew up in quite the opposite type of atmosphere. It was more of an angry atmosphere and angry culture looks something like this, that there, there are really no boundaries. People will talk over you at all times, thinking that what they have to say is a whole lot more important than what you have to say. They'll put you down so that they can rise up and and act as if they're smarter than you. They know better than you. Um, They're always putting you down. My father's best phrase was, oh, you're still wet behind the ears, meaning I hadn't had enough experience. Therefore, I was stupid or dumb or just that was the connotation there. It was that type of, of not only verbal, but but physical abuse and and sexual abuse. And there were a lot of abuses in my home growing up. And it, I really did w- want to distance myself from that. So I started stu- studying more about the love languages, Eve. That's how I got there. Okay. And, you know, the love languages is a book that's been around for, I think, over 20, 25 years. It's, mm-hmm. it's a very uh, well-read book around the world. I know it's been, um, you know, changed into different languages and, it's really kind of a universal language. Can you go over the different love languages today? Of course, Eve. Thank you for inviting me to do that. So what I what I did was I I actually started reading the love languages and and started I read through the book four or five times and coming from where I came from, Eve, I really didn't get it. You mean, Doctor Chapman, that if I guess what Eve's love language is and I cater to that, we're going to be buddies, and you're calling that love? that catering? Uh, I said, you know, I came from an angry background. That didn't sound like love. Well, then who am I to say what love was in the first place? But it just didn't sound right. And it wasn't working for me, Eve, because I'm a bad guesser. I wasn't really good at guessing what is the love like? What does this person want from me that will help them be happy? And it just wasn't working that way for me. And the second thing that Dr. Chapman had was that, well, if you take this survey then you can find out what your love language is. And I realized that, well, what am I supposed to do with that, Eve? Advertise, hello, Eve, I'm gifts. Or in this case, hello, Eve, I'm physical touch. What do you have for me today? And it's just that type of thing that just wasn't wasn't working well at all. So I contacted Dr. Chapman and, and, and asked him, are, are you licensing those little icons for the love languages? Because I had an idea. Even as dysfunctional as our family was growing up, I thought that games brought our family together. There were still all the put downs. There was still all the aggressive competition, but it just brought our family together. Thought it felt nice to be together in that way. So I thought I, I could make it a game. But Dr. Chapman's attorney wrote back after a couple of weeks and said, no, we're not licensing those icons at this time. So I had a, a friend that lived in my neighborhood that was a copyright attorney, an intellectual property attorney. I, and I, I told him the idea. And he said that theory, like the love language theory, is not copyrightable. Application is. So they weren't doing it as a game. So I felt appropriate to create my own icons for each one of the symbols. And then I made it into a game. And so this this will go over the love languages with. For those listeners that are listening right now, I'm holding up a cube. It's a dice that I created. It's about one inch by one inch. And on the side I'm showing Eve right now, 
there's it looks like a waiter holding a platter that would represent service so waiters serve us at the restaurants service looks like this it looks like someone that wants really is really happy when you wash their car someone that's really happy when you take the trash out or vacuum the carpet or help with the dishes or the laundry something like that people like to be served in one way or another when they're served that way they light up they just get really happy they get excited they're just really in a different space when you cater to that type of, of love language the next one i'll hold up is, is two hands put together to create a heart and then from that heart there's a conversation fly up so these would be the words of the heart this represent the words that we say to one another the compliments or the uh just the i love you or just you look so sexy today. Whatever that compliment would be, would be just th the words. And people light up when that happens. People that light up for words, they'll just they'll want to hear that more often than anything else. The next one is a hand holding an hourglass. Hourglass measures time. So on that particular icon, they're just looking to spend time with you. You don't even have to talk, really. Eve. Those people like is just to be in your presence. My wife loves Korean dramas. And so we have to read the captions all the time. So really can't <laughs> talk. And so while we're reading the captions, she just likes me to be there with her. And so that's spending time with her. Next one is, is the touch. Two hands that are touching one another represents physical touch. That's just intimacy. It could be, it could be just the high five, the fist bump, or like we're in football season right now, it could be the chest bump that all those football players do in the end zone after they score a touchdown or have an interception or something that happens that's good that way. And the last love language would be gifts. Gifts is pretty self-explanatory. It could be something that's purchased, or I like to see gifts as something that could be a hug, something that could be a note, the words, so just spending time with someone or serving someone. Gifts is kind of the umbrella love language, as I see it. It really doesn't have to cost anything. You don't have to be just say, oh, I rolled gifts. I don't want to do that today. And it's just, it doesn't have to be that kind of situation. It's just something that people like gifts from time to time. Obviously, they like it for Christmas. They like it for anniversaries. They like it for, for their birthday, anything like that. So five love languages, six sides on the cube. The sixth side I created it has a hand with a question mark. The question mark is means surprise me. So you can do random acts of kindness, just surprise whoever it is that you're doing, that um, that you're expecting to love that particular day. Two two instructions, Eve. You roll the cube every day, whatever it lands on. That is a love language you practice giving away all day that day. And while you're giving it away, now you're watching, because you're in, in a specific genre of love, you're watching for people that light up. You've made their day. When they light up, you now discovered their primary love language. No longer do you have to say, <clears throat> excuse me, could we pause this relationship for a moment? Why have, have you take this survey so I know how to love you? Just use your, <laughs> use your observation skills. We don't have to do awkward anymore. I agree with you. And on that note, I think why guess at all and why not just say what's your love language because it's it really does help to connect with your partner. I like the idea of, of the game and so you are basically giving this love to everybody that you encounter that day and mm -hmm. and see right. how the, and so it's an interesting, you know, experiment to do, you know, in your life in general, uh, because there are always key players in everybody's life. I mean, the people that you work with, um, you know, obviously your children, your, your, your partner, um, your family. Um, so it's, it would be an interesting experiment to see how everybody would react to that particularly. Um, and the gifts, you know, I like the concept that you, um, you said that it was like sort of an umbrella term where gifts can kind of go under any of those other umbrellas too. Because for me, I always think of gifts as like giving gifts, like receiving gifts. And, um, you know, I almost like in my mind, it, it almost forms like a materialistic type idea in my mind, you know, of people that, you know, if that's their primary love, love language, that they just 
want the material all the time, but that does not necessarily what you're talking about. It can be a piece of paper, you know, with words of affirmation on it, you know, um, boxed in a little, you know, gift box or something like that. You know, it doesn't have to cost money. Yeah, exactly right. And it, it's, it's the whole idea is that instead of guessing or instead of, of even asking someone what their love language is, the whole idea is just to use your observation skills. And that's really going to be the best barometer. And I have a real a story about that. Uh, just probably within the last uh, four or five months, I met a gentleman that that until he found out about the, the cube and started rolling the die, he, he, his wife was telling him, my love language is service. But he would wash the dishes. He would wash the car. He would gas up the car. He would take care of the kids. He would do all these things. She did not respond. But she said that's what she liked. But What was he looking for in terms of a response? Well, just what I said, that she wouldn't light up. She would not manifest that physically or externally in any way that she, that's what really lit her up. But okay. He started rolling the die and mm -hmm. then, and then rolled it on words a couple of times. And he said that the words, the words is what really lit her up. That's what got her really excited. And in that way, discovered really what her primary love language is. And so the survey can be skewed and you can skew surveys by just saying, oh, this is a survey. I know what they're doing. And you can just kind of skew it and say, this is the outcome that I'm looking for. Therefore, I'm going to answer in this way. And you can skew it that, that way. And right. a lot of people might do that uh, maybe accidentally, maybe on purpose, maybe just in, innocently. They'll skew that that survey. So the watching the body language is a whole lot better way to detect what their real love language is. And that's that's the whole idea of this. During the course of a day of practicing that one genre of love language, I, I'm a salesperson. So I go out and talk to business owners every single day. And while I'm talking to these business owners, I'm just watching for for things that they I might discover what their love language is just within a few minutes that I'm visiting with them. And if I can discover what their love language is and, and, and then hone in on that a little bit, it makes it a whole lot easier for me to come back and to talk to them a little bit more about the business pr proposition that I would have for them. Just makes it a lot easier to, to be able to use it in a sales situation, use it for customer retention if you're a business, or use it for uh, employee retention if you're a business as well. It just works in a lot of different situations. And it works, uh, Dr. Chapman wrote the book about it, using it within your own uh, you know, significant other type of situation, a rom more romantic type situation. My This concept is that I was single when I created this. I said, Dr. Chapman, I don't have a significant other. Who in the heck am I supposed to love? And just <laughs> Just dawned on me. Well, I guess I have to love everybody, and and the whole idea about that, Eve, is that I don't know anybody that's with their significant other twenty four seven. So that love actually becomes a part time job. I needed that full time situation because from that angry society I came from, I found myself stacking annoyance on top of annoyance on top of annoyance on top of annoyance till I have that flash of anger. I, don't, I would never know what straw would break that camel's back and I'd have that flash of anger, go back down and then start the stacking again until I had that annoyance or that flash of anger again. And it just cyclic in that way. I wanted to get away from that, that whole culture that I was raised in, get away from that. So instead of stacking annoyance on top of annoyance, I stack kindness on top of kindness, on top of kindness, on top of kindness. Instead of saying, What's wrong with that person? Why do they do it that way? And having that boundary that I didn't have growing up, having that boundary that says, I'm not in charge of them. I can't make their choices for them. And what makes me think that I'm better than them to try to force my suggestions on them? I can ask if they want advice. And if they say yes, then I can offer it. Or they can ask me if they, if they for advice. But I really can't force my advice on them. And when I realize that I'm not in charge of that person, you can't believe the sigh of relief I had. It was just a big burden that was lifted off my shoulders. Oh, the only thing I can do, I can't bid love to come my way, but the only thing I can do is I can send it out 
and I can respond when it comes my way. This really helped me to understand the languages of love to send it out. And by doing that, doing it every single day, I learned all five love languages. So now I'm fluent in all five love languages. So it's easier to see it now when it comes my way. A lot of times it might not be my primary love language, but I can say, oh, they're loving on me. I can respond to that. It's a huge difference. I, I love the concept of being fluent mm -hmm. in love languages because it is a language and you do need to practice in order to become good at it, you know? And so this is a perfect way to become good at all of the love languages if you're constantly using them throughout the day with people that you encounter. Can you tell me, and you pick, you know, whichever love language, tell me what a day like this looks like for you. And, you know, with, uh, with examples of like what you would say to, you know, the postman or wh whoever it is that you encounter, I'm just curious um, to see how you kind of put this in place. So today, the first thing in the morning, uh, right after I wake up, say my prayers and, and get started for the day, first thing I do is roll the die. And then that kind of sets a purpose for the day, Eve. It really, it really does define, this is the type of uh, opportunities to love that I'm watching for all day that day. And so for physical touch that I rolled this morning, what I'm watching for is opportunities to do the high five, the fist bump. I went to the post office and, and just, just, you know, what can you do at the post office? But you can do the high five, you can do the fist bump, and you can thank them. You can actually do uh, do touch their hearts. And that's almost a physical touch, but you can touch their heart with your words and have it be a virtual touch, so to speak, that way. You can touch people on Zoom like this and have that be also a virtual touch, the best you can do. If you're on the East Coast and I'm on the West Coast, I mean, that's the best you can do on that day but it still is something that you can do as far as physical touch. What the whole idea of this Eve is, is that as you're stacking kindness on top of kindness on top of kindness, you're using these love languages as the basic love languages, the basics that everybody should learn. Everybody knows the alphabet. Most people know the alphabet. And this is more like that, that this is, this is a reading skill. This is a loving skill that everyone should have. By practicing these loving skills and practicing these kindness on top of kindness, you get to the higher laws of love, like intimacy, or like, like uh, charity, or compassion, or mercy, or forgiveness, or empathy, or sympathy. Those are all higher laws of love. This gets you there. Can you imagine insulting, 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 and then asking somebody for intimate relations after you've done all that? all throughout the day. This is the, the warm up, the foreplay, so to speak, of love. This, this really will get you to the point that they'll, you'll be able to access those higher laws of love. And that's the whole idea of this. That's what, the, that's what a day in my life looks like. I'm always watching for opportunities that I can, I can help pat somebody on the back. Obviously, it's above the waist in this situation since we're talking. <laughs> It's not going to be below the waist at, at that particular time, unless obviously it's someone that you know intimately. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, you're absolutely right. When it comes to intimacy, you have to really feel safe in that other mm -hmm. person's presence. And, um, and knowing their love language really does allow you to connect with their heart, you know, and, um, and, you know, in some of the, the material that I read, um, about you in particular, um, you know, you associate love and, and godliness, you know, and, um, and in my opinion, you know, God created love, right? And so the absence of love is hate. Um, so could you just kind of um, elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm a Christian, and, and I, I really resonated with me, as I mentioned, that, um, you know, Dr. Gary Chapman is a Baptist preacher. And as a Baptist preacher, he said that these five love languages actually reconcile to the life of Jesus Christ. We love, we love his words. He spent time with people. Obviously, if you read his words, you'll know he served people. He touched people's eyes so they could see and touched their ears so they could hear. You know, there's also, you know, after he was resurrected and appeared to Mary, 
before he actually had been to his father, he said, touch me not. And she must have been coming in for the hug or just coming in in some way to want to give him that affection at that particular time. He said, you can't do that right now. Just touch me not. So touch must have absolutely been an integral part of his ministry. And then he also had the gifts of the Spirit. So he had all these things together. And you, you don't ever see Jesus actually talk, talking about not feeling loved, that he felt really sad that nobody loved him on that particular day. He was always out and about. And, and the whole thing about this, Eve, is that you, know, you can have your own pity party and stay home and wait for the door to doorbell to ring and hope that somebody's going to love you on that day. You're going to have a very long day. It's going to be a very sad day. Why would you choose to do that? You need to get out and about, and you can walk down the street of any neighborhood in any neighborhood anywhere in the world. There's pain under every household. You can find someone that is having maybe a little bit more pain than you on that particular day, lift them up, and while you're lifting them up, you're making their day but it's giving you great satisfaction by doing that. You're sending this love out without any expectation of anything coming back, but trusting the laws of the universe back to Jesus, the law of the harvest, or, or to karma, or to the law of attraction. Any of those laws say that whatever you send out, someday will come back. Trust in those laws that someday it'll come back, but you'll get that satisfaction that you made that person's day a little bit better. By just helping them out but you got to get out of that chair and do it walk down the street and find find pain in another household that's deeper than your pain lift them up a little bit farther out of that hole of pain absolutely uh intimacy you know goes hand in hand with um feeling you know loved especially for women who need that emotional um connection before they can have intimate relations um you know as as far as um religion goes, I personally, um, I don't consider myself religious, but I am very spiritual. And I do believe that God gave us sexuality. I mean, it's the only way that we are all here, right? Um, mm -hmm. With Without it, you know, none of us would be here. No animals would be here <laughs> on earth. So, you know, sex is such an important part of our lives. And it's interesting that, you know, still, it's so difficult for many people to talk about. So how did you move from, you know, childhood abuse, which, you know, I can relate to com completely. Um, how did you move from, from childhood abuse to um, loving relationships? And did you find that um, this game you created uh, brought you more loving relationships? Good questions, Eve. Let me, let me just tell you that this stacking of the anger that was happening and these flashes of, of, of outbursts that, that would happen actually contributed to the demise of my first marriage after 23 and a half years of being married and, and just, and eight children, we just, you know, uh, it just fell apart. And, and so I was by myself. I decided I was going to have an excellent midlife crisis so when and I was I was prime primary custodian for the children after the divorce, and and so when it was her turn to have the children for the, her her weekend, what I would do is I'd set in advance a time and a, a, a date and a place that I'd meet someone from someone online. We'd set a destination city where we'd meet. I'd go to that city, have a date, and then go back home. And so I did that for about a year and a half. I call it destination dating because I went all over the place. I went to Daytona Beach, Florida, uh, Jacksonville, Florida, Columbia, South Carolina, Char uh, Charleston, South Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina, Atlanta, Georgia, New York City, Salt Lake City, Kansas City, Nashville, Phoenix, Cabo San Lucas, many, many other cities. But I went to all those cities just for a date, just for a date, that was it. And so I was having a great time traveling all the, over the place, but it was like the words of that song, Eve, you're looking for love in all the wrong places. And I think that <laughs> I think that, that that if you're looking for sex in, in that situation, you're looking for that higher law of love. But to get there, you've just got to stack these kindnesses. And I and it wasn't working in that 
in those situations at all because it was just a little little tiny moment of time and it, there wasn't enough time to to really get to that point those higher laws of love that way wasn't finding what i was looking for at the particular time so here i am now there's uh, three and a half years later there's just three children left in the home now and then my ex-wife decides that she wanted primary custody again she was done with her little thing and and she wanted the children back, the remaining three, but she was going to move in with her parents in California. Now there's a 40 year old, mid 40s, moving back with parents. Most parents would say no, but the parents um, uh, agreed to it. And I thought, you know what? I was number 10 of 11 children myself. And so I didn't really have a chance to get to know my grandfathers. They both passed away before I was ever born. And one grandmother lived 350 miles east and the other one was 350 miles west of where I grew up. And so we didn't see them very often at all. I thought this would be a perfect opportunity for those last three children to get to know their grandparents. So I relinquished custody. Now I'm all by myself. And now my older sister, I'm, I'm, uh, I've am i got an older sister, younger sister, all the rest are boys. So I'm kind of the a thorn between two roses. But that older sister called me one day and said, I've got a friend or neighbor that I want to introduce to you. My sister was living seven hours away from me at the time. I said, come on, sis, I'm done in done doing this destination dating. I don't, want to, <laughs> I don't want to keep doing that. I didn't work out. And she, like big old big sister, an older sister says, oh, come on. I said, okay, I'll email her. What kind of relationship can you develop? Email, and and obviously no sexuality at all. Just what what can you develop with the email? And so I started emailing, and she was a really good writer. So after four or five tries of, of, or four or five messages back and forth, I got brave even. I said, well, how many times have you been married? And And she writes back and says, counting the five that are buried in the backyard? <laughs> I, just like that, I howled with laughter. I thought, I've got a live one here. I've got someone with personality. I've got someone that has a sense of humor. And I, I wanted to pursue this a little bit more. So we ke- became more serious and actually moved up to where my sister was living. That's where I live, live now. And it, now we're starting to get serious. And so now it's time for big brother approval. Again, I'm number 10 of 11. I always have to have that big brother approval. So I take her 300 miles north to my brother's house. First thing that happens with my sister-in-law, pulls her aside and said, the only emotion that the Zolman family learned growing up was anger. At first I said, huh? That didn't make me mad. And I thought, <laughs> I just absolutely verified exactly what she said. That's when I started thinking I, I needed to, do, to do, make that change and um, make that uh, make a difference in my own life. Become better, a better person for that whoever I would want to be with um, that and I think that that, for your listeners, I think that that's the key to wanting to improve yourself for for that sexual ex- experience, for that intimacy, for for that forgiveness, for that for that compassion that you want, for all that. That that's going to be the end result of a good foundational relationship, and a good foundational relationship starts with practicing the love languages in many different ways. You know, I think the survey E will put put a person into a box. And they say, this is what you like. That's all I'm going to feed you all day. You get tacos every day for the rest of your life. And and then it just, and then people get tired of tacos. So this gives the variety, rolling the die gives the variety every single day of sending out love languages. Yes. And, you know, knowing your spouses or, you know, the, the person that's, that you're in a relationship, knowing their love language helps you to be able to connect with them. Um so I definitely recommend people trying to have these conversations with their partners about, you know, all of the love languages, because really, you know, many of the love languages will speak to you. One of them will be the most specific to you, but the other ones may be a close second or third, you know, so um, knowing that about yourself um, and and then sharing that with your partner is important because, you know, if they don't, if they are always, you know, giving you gifts, but you know, your love language is acts of service and they never do anything specific for you. 
um, you're going to be unhappy, even if you're getting, you know, you're getting rained on by all of these gifts, you know, so really knowing that about your partner, I think is really important. Um, and I say, take the guesswork out and have a conversation. This is how we connect um, with our partners um, and how we are able to really get um, to the point where we want to be more intimate um, and, and, uh, and connect in that way. Wouldn't you agree with that? Absolutely, Eve. And, and I like to describe it this way, and it may be a, a, a gross uh, way to describe it, but, but I'm going to go with it anyway. That, <laughs> you know, if, if, you, if you're in the swimming pool and someone has an accident and everybody else scatters, that's what it's like to have these bouts of anger that you repel people. And yes. it, it wasn't me, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. And just that person is isolated all by themselves in that swimming pool. You don't want to get to the point where you're isolated and just thinking that that uh, that it's that it's all their fault. If you get to the blame game or you get to the victim game that points at another person that it's their fault, you don't have to make any changes in your life at all. You'll stay right in the same spot. But if you want to be worse, you know how to get worse. But if you want to be better, then there are tools now, a love tool. And you know, it might sound might sound uh, crude to say it's a role of love. It's not R-O-L-L. And it's not like what you do in the sheets like you talked about in the very beginning. It's It could be, but it's not. That's not the intention here. The intention is to change you as an individual, to weave in that fabric these love languages so that the fabric of who you are actually becomes better, more attractive to people that you'll draw people to you. And that's when people want to come to you. They'll want to be intimate with you. They'll want to have that association with you. They'll want to be connected in any way, shape, or form that they could be connected to you. And that's the whole idea of what you're trying to accomplish here, that you're trying to help people with their love languages, help people identify what they might like. My wife does not roll the die, Eve, just, just to, to be upfront and, and transparent there. What she does, though, is she tries to guess what love language am I practicing that particular day. Okay. Back, back, back. <laughs> yeah, and it's great. It's a it's fun. It's nice because you make it a game and it, it becomes a conversation piece, you know. It is a fun game. And, um, you know, the other day I was in church and I had my arm around her and she was putting her head on my, on my shoulder. And and um, and a guy that was sitting behind me after the service uh, comes up to me and says, I think I know what love language you rolled today. <laughs> Just like, it, was, it was hilarious to me and and it was a guy and I said okay bring it on in and I put up my arms and just, you know, just gave, gave him a big hug because he guessed I I did I rolled physical touch on that particular day and it was so interesting that people will watch you and they'll watch what you're doing for that day knowing that you're practicing love language what love language is are they practicing today and it's really a fun game to watch for other people too what what kind of love is she sending out right now? And the whole idea of the love language, your primary love language is what you like to receive. But sending it out is so much fun. It really is. And you really need to refine the way you send it out because most people feel comfortable sending their own primary love language out, but they might not feel comfortable sending the others out. This re makes you a more well-rounded person, as I said it, it adds to that fabric and knits that your hearts together with other people of a different love language too. And it's really a great way to close that communication gap so that you'll have better relationships, better intimacy. As I mentioned, I have eight children. Uh, intimacy is a great part of that. When you find something that you like, you just keep doing it. <laughs> yes. And, um, you know, that is the way that adults play. So whether you have eight children from your first relationship or are you, you said you were married for a second time, correct? Do you have any children in your second relationship? Just stepchildren, not, not children together, but step. Gotcha. Okay. Very good. So, you know, whether yeah. it's, you know, yeah. e either way, you know, we're talking about intimacy in terms of just pleasure, you know, and, um, and what better way than to practice all of the love languages to become fluent, you know? I mean, I love that concept of becoming fluent in all of the love languages so that you can really 
love on everybody. You know, it's not just your partner that you need to love on. You can love on yourself. You can love on your partner. You can love on your family, your children, your, I mean, everybody can benefit. And I know that that particular book, The Love Languages, was actually rewritten um, in a lot of different ways. And I think that one of the ways was, um, you know, figuring out the love language of your children so that you can better help them to like develop and, and um, you know, be a better parent. So um, I and I did buy that book and I read that one, you know, just to help me with my kids, too. And I was like, oh, you know, <laughs> you know, light bulbs went off after reading it. I was like, you know, I can really relate to my children more. But, you know, just not just knowing the love language, but actually practicing it on a daily basis. This is what's going to gain the fluency. So um, it is a really interesting concept. So that's, you mentioned tools um, that you suggest for love. And is this particular game the tool that you use on it? You say that you use it daily, but are there other tools that you use in order to create that intimacy? Good question. And I, I think that one of the things that um, helps create the intimacy too is, is actually keeping a journal. Just keeping keeping a journal of how you express love in a, on a particular day. In fact, I've created, created a, a journal page that says what you rolled, what opportunities you see to love in that way, then what you did about those opportunities it becomes a love journal. Something I would have loved to have from my mother, my grandmother, my grandfather. Instead, Eve, I got a journal about the weather. The weather, 60 years ago. Who cares what the weather was like 60 years ago? I would have loved to have a journal about how they loved and what they loved in their particular day. How did they express love to their spouse? How did they, what did, and, and not so much intimacy, but how did they express love? And, you know, they're living in a one room house. How did that happen? How did they have 10 children in a one room <laughs> house? How did that happen? It's interesting to figure out what how creative do they have to be to express love in their particular day. I would have loved to have a journal like that. So in the school in the school systems, we put these these in the hands of the teacher. They roll it, takes two seconds or less at the beginning of the day, maybe 30 to 45 seconds to explain what that love language is, what they're looking for that particular day. So at the end of the day, that child is given a journal page. They have to write what they did that day. How did they love that particular day? It puts at the top of the mind for that child, I've got to find a way to love today because I've got to write something at the end of the day. While they're thinking about that, hardly ever would they go 180 degrees and think, I'm going to hurt that person. I'm going to have a fight after school. I'm going to start beating up. I'm going to bully that person. They're not going to have those thoughts if they're started the day with, how can I love today? You know, it'll tamp down a lot of that bullying and then that sort of thing. I think in marriages too, you may get to the the, the casual point that you might want to put, put, be putting somebody down or doing something. It's not a good idea for any relationship. It's not a good idea. But this helps you keep that focus and keep that 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 um, that level of love to the point that intimacy could be random. It could be something that we'd be ready for anytime and have it be spontaneous. I think most couples would want something like that. They'd want the ability to have that randomness, that that uh, uh, just spontaneity for having intimacy. And, and it really works that way. I remember when I first got married, my first time around, I had an older brother that said, for every time you have sex in the first year, you put a penny in, in the jar. He said, and, and after that first year, you'll spend the rest of your life if taking the pennies out one by one for the times that you have intimacy. And I didn't, I thought, what the heck is he saying? And I didn't really understand how you slow down after a cer certain period of time that you slow down and you become more selective and you become just, it just becomes more meaningful as you have pauses and punctuate, pauses and punctuate. And I think that that works, works in any relationship that you'll want to have those times that you don't want to be syrupy all day long to that person that's going to get really sweet, too sweet too, and, and, and you'll just need the salty once in a while. So just develop the relationship and, and develop it in a lot of different ways. Have the variety that you need. These tools, the, I've got a book that I wrote 
and I've got the journal and I've got the dice. Those are the tools that will help you get to that point of being able to have better relationships. Both, those are the tools I have right now. I'm developing more as we speak, but um, that's what I've got right now. Nice. I I love tools to help, you know, with creating, you know, intimacy and, and love and communication. Really, communication is the bottom line. And, and you know, journaling is a communication with yourself right. um, and really uh, trying to tease out all of the things that you are thinking that day that, you know, um, and the things that you want to work on, the goals that you want to accomplish. There's so many reasons to journal and it's such a great tool. Um, and, you know, specifically doing it in the way that you have designed um, does really help with that fluency. Uh, so um, I'm, I might pick up one of those myself. <laughs> um, so I want to make sure that all of my guests can find you. Can you please let us know where we can find you? Sure. It's a, they can find all these tools that we just talked about on my website at rolloflove.com. Again, R-O-L-L -L is something that happens outside of you. R-O-L-E is the change that happens within. So it's R-O-L-E of love.com. And you'll find that I've got a package deal right now, a bundle deal, that you can get the cube, you can get the book and the journal all for $29.99. It's a whole lot less than even one therapy session. And it's going to last you and develop your relationships a whole lot longer than just one therapy session will ever ever do. And it's kind of a, 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 a hobby or a holistic type of therapy that you're rolling the die, you're forcing yourself or or determining by yourself to love all day that day and all, all day in that particular way, whatever you rolled that day. And you're watching for those opportunities. The more you watch for those opportunities, the more you'll see it. It's just like a vocabulary word. If you think you hear a new vocabulary word and you start using the vocabulary word, all of a sudden, now you're hearing it all over the place. Or it's like you're buying a new car, you're buying a Volvo and you start driving it. And now you're seeing all those Volvos that you never saw before. It's right. just like that. As you're watching for these opportunities, love, you'll see them more often than you ever saw them before. Forget about the opportunities for criticism. They'll always be there. And everybody has faults, but focus on the 80 to 90% of that person that's really good. Forget about the 10, 20% of their mistakes or their faults or their weaknesses. Forget about focusing on that. Focus on the good of that person. It's going to make your intimate relationships a whole lot better. Absolutely. And everybody has faults and weaknesses. I mean, nobody is perfect. So really appreciating people's imperfections too, um, I think is key. Um, so yeah, the tools are a great idea for sure. Um, but I have to say, um, that, you know, therapy is also very pertinent and relevant for a lot of people. Um, I myself went through many, many years of therapy with and without other people, you know, involved, and it was a big game changer in me healing from, you know, my history of abuse. Um, and, you know, you got to it a different way, which I think is great, but it did take you, you know, a divorce to finally find that for yourself. And it's interesting because I find that, you know, people really start to connect with, you know, themselves as they get a little bit older and really truly understand who they are much later on than, you know, what we consider the prime of, you know, life. Um, oftentimes the prime is considered, you know, your twenties and maybe your thirties, but after that you're, you know, <laughs> not in your prime anymore. And, um, and I very much disagree with that because I feel like as you do uh, get older and learn more about yourself, you become much more in tune with who you are, you know, authentically. Um, and you can really all then, you know, give of yourself um, in a way that you're talking about. I absolutely agree. You've well, very well said that uh, I think that the best is yet to come. And here we are. Yes, absolutely. Definitely. <laughs> well, I appreciate you being on the show today. Um, this has been really interesting. And I want to just mention here, too, that I am a licensed physical therapist and I treat conditions of sexual health, um, such as erectile dysfunction, vaginal dryness and decreased vaginal sensitivity, um, incontinence, painful sex, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So if you are experiencing any of those things, please reach out to me 
do not be shy. Uh, there is no shame in seeking help for sexual dysfunction. Uh, so on that note, I am going to say goodbye. And thank you so much for joining me today, Paul. Thank you, Eve. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Until next time. Her favorite toys and for swag that shows that you